Before I begin, <clears throat> Mr. James Malisi and I had a discussion on how I'd be introduced, and uh, he didn't follow through. I'm surprised at that. Um, we had discussed that the introduction would be to maximize your afflicting of souls. You'll be hearing a message from Jim Chance, but apparently that was not said. So. <laughs> Before I begin, I want to tell you a little story that happened on David Tillman. It really has very little to do with the message, but it's an interesting thing. It's kind of the stuff that happens to me at times. The first time I did a complete fast in church, I was actually 12 years old. I'm not sure why we waited so long. I probably could have done it sooner, but <clears throat> that was the year. I, as some of you know, I grew, grew up in the church. So we did a fast, a complete fast. In those days, it was two services. Some of you probably re re remember, re remember those days. And I was standing next to a person during the first song. And um, <clears throat> we were sharing a song book. This man was in his 40s. His name was Mr. Miller. And halfway during the first song, he passes right out, takes out two or three chairs, and falls in the middle of the floor. It turns out he had a problem with fasting and he would actually pass out. Nobody told me, the guy fasting for the first time, that I was going to have a guy pass, passing out in front of me. And they literally carried him out of the, of the place. But later he came and we talked about it. I find it very, very, very funny how that worked out. So, so today, let's start off with asking a question. What word in the English language has the most definitions meanings or themes. Do you have any guesses on that one? Huh? Uh, no, it's actually the word, believe it or not, set. And I, lo I looked it up. The word with the most meanings in the English language is the word set. With over 430, they call it senses, listed in the second edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, published in 1989. The word commands the longest entry in the dictionary at some dictionaries around 60,000 words or at others at, at and 326 characters. So, um, Mr. James, you can start handing the hand, handout out. <clears throat> I'm going to hand you out a handout. So, in the Bible, because we have the Hebrew and the Greek language, now this is a handout for one per, like, you have to share. I, I didn't print the ton here, but, but it'll come up in a minute. So in, in the Bible, fortunately, we have the Hebrew and the Greek language, and they're not as loose with their definitions. They're, they're, pretty, they're pretty strong, but one word that does have quite a few meanings or themes or definitions is the word atonement. It has... It actually comes from six different words in the Bible. It comes from the word kapar, comes from the word kareth, kapareth, and if I'm saying this wrong, I'm sure those who know Hebrew will tell me later. The word kapor, in the Greek it comes from the word halaskama, and then also something called helisterion, Helisterion, and then last we have catalage or catalage. So these are where the word atonement in Scripture will come from. And if we look into these words in the Bible, we will get a series of themes or what this day is about. This day is about, it was a great message this morning from Mr. Hill, but this day means so much, has so many different themes in, within, within this day. So we're going to go through these words, a part of this message, and we're going to define in a more deep understanding what are the themes, what are the definitions, what are the meanings within the Day of Atonement. So let's start with that word kafar, that Hebrew word kafar. And this comes mainly from Strong's. Now what I did in the handout, to give you a little thing, uh, actually, and I want to thank my son Austin, he and I worked on it together. Uh, in that handout, I took every place that in the King James where you have those words in that handout for you to look at. And I believe we came with 138 places in the Bible where those six words are used. And that's where that ha handout is when you look at that. So that's a little study guide for you. You can take that handout. 
And after we're through these messages today, if you want to kill some time while you're thinking about your fast, go through those 138 verses, take a look at them, and it's all about atonement and what atonement means. Give you a little help. And if you want it electronically, I've got it in a nice little spreadsheet. And we looked at it. So let's, let's start again with Kapar here. So it says, to cover, purge, make atonement, appease, pacify, proliferate, make reconciliation, cover over with pitch, and cleanse. Those are, it can be used in any one of those words. Is the same word can be translated kafar. Also gets translated as atonement. So let's go through this and, and look at each one. Turn over to Genesis 6.14. We'll start with Genesis 14. We'll start with the easy one first. Now, <clears throat> atonement has so many different meanings and so many different origins and possible, um, what we call, interpretations of the word that all the translations just do not agree. I was, I was quite intrigued when I was read, when do, doing this study that the... The, K, the King James Version, the New King James Version, the NIV, sometimes they'll translate things totally different. And it's very, but, but in the end, the root is still, is still well done. It's just that it's completely translated different. And we'll see that as we go along. But let's start with the easy one first. The first time we have a type of atonement, or one of the origins of the word atonement, this kafar, is actually found in Genesis 6.14. And I'm going to try to read uh, the, the slight differences between the um, uh, verses. So in 6.14, Genesis 6.14, we have, Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. In the New International Version, it, instead of saying the word covered, it says coat it with pitch. Now, it, this is where atonement or is used in a sense of an action, and many times it is, in the sense of a covering. The wood was covered on the ark so that it would become one. Basically, it would be one piece of wood and it would not leak water. That's what the goal of that was. So this is the easy way to cover or to cover with pitch. And that leads us to our first definition or meaning or theme of atonement and that is and sometimes the Jews actually call it this this is called a day of covering and as we all know that's mostly for sin which we'll see in a minute but this is a day of, co of covering another one of our definitions of a kapar was make atonement or atonement and as we heard in our message this morning it's really a nice way to say it is at one mint. In this case, it's covering sin. And again, turn over to Leviticus 4. We're going to read, Le read Leviticus 4 in verse 13. And it's kind of a long passage here. I'm going to read it in the New King, King James, and then we'll highlight it in the NIV. So in the New King James, starting in verse 13, we're going to read about 20 verses here. Now the whole congregation, and I, and I may paraphrase some of this, and now the whole congregation sins now, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally, and this thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done something against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which should not be done, and are guilty. When the sin which they have committed becomes known, then the assembly shall offer a young bull for the sin and bring it before the tabernacle of meeting. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord. Then the bull shall be killed before the Lord. The anointed priest shall bring some of the bull's blood to the tabernacle of meeting, then the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. And he shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar which is before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall pour the remaining of the blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. He shall take all the fat from it and burn it on the altar. And he shall do with the bull as he has done with the bull as a sin offering. Thus he shall do with it. So the priest shall make an atonement for them and it shall be forgiven them. Then he shall carry the bull outside the camp and burn it, with he, with he, and burn it 
as he burned the first bull, it is a sin offering for the assembly. And in verse 22, basically it's the same thing for a ruler. If a ruler sins unintentionally, and again, they're going to bring a goat this time, as uh, in this case, and they shall lay hands on the goat, and again, they'll kill the goat, and they'll sacrifice it as, as a peace offering, and make atonement, skipping down to verse 26, and he shall burn all his fat on the altar, like the fat of the sacrifice of the peace offering, so the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. In verse 27, we have, if any one of the common people intentionally sins. Again, this is another type of sin offering or sin sacrifice. And again, in this case, they need to bring a lamb and a sin offering. And skipping down to verse 32, if he brings a lamb and his sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish. Then he shall lay his hands on the head of the sin offering and kill it. And the sin offering and the place where he lay, they kill the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger, put it on the horns of the altar, and burn offering, and pour all the remaining blood of the base of the altar. 35. He shall remove all its fat, and the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering. Then the priest shall burn it on the altar according to the offerings made by fire to the Lord. So the priest shall make an atonement for his sin and that he has committed and it shall be forgiven. Highlighting it in the NIV, the verses to highlight are 20, 26, 31, and 35. And I'll just read those briefly. So 20 says, and do with this bull just as he did with the bull for the sin offering and this way the priest will make atonement. In 26, again, the priest will make atonement, this kafar, for the leader's sin. In 31, again, going down through here, it says, and the priest will make atonement. And also in 35. Now jumping over to Deuteronomy 21, we see another example of this atonement, this at one -ment. And that's in Deuteronomy 21 and verse 8. And it says, be merciful, O Lord, now this is where the translations get interesting because actually the King James Version in this case is actually better than, than the other ones. But I, I, will read, I will read that to you. So be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood unto the people Israel charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. In the NIV it says, except this atonement for your people of Israel, whom you have redeemed, Lord. Do not hold your people guilty of the blood of an innocent person. So atonement. So this brings us to another type of theme or type of meaning of the day of atonement and that is this is a day of the sin sacrifice. Specifically the sin sacrifice fulfilled. And that is the word kafar. Another meaning of the word kafar found in scriptures, and again you'll see it, you can see that in your handout, is this concept of appease or pacify, which actually means a state of peace, quiet, ease, and calm. Let's go over to Genesis 32, Genesis 32 and verse 20. And it says, and again I say, behold your servant Jacob is behind us, for he said, I will appease kafar, him with the pres present that goes before me and afterwards I will see his face perhaps he will accept me. In the NIV it almost says the same thing but it says skipping a little bit into the verse it says your servant Jacob is coming behind us for he thought I will pacify him these gifts I am sending on ahead later when I see him perhaps he will receive me. So again another definition of kapar is appease or pacify meaning a state of peace quiet ease and calm. The Proverbs 16 14 it says as a messenger of death the king is the king's wrath but a wise man will appease it. That's in the New King James. And in, the, and in the NIV, it pretty much says the same thing. It uses the word appease. So another theme or another meaning in the Day of Atonement is this concept of a day of peace. 
of appeasement, of pacify, when we will, we will be at peace with God. Let's move on to another one of these themes. And again, this is in Leviticus 6, and we'll read it also in Ezekiel. And in another meaning of the word kapar is reconcile or reconciliation. Now we heard about that a lot in the first message, but we'll just hear a little bit, little bit more about it. Now, what reconcile or reconciliation means is to restore friendship or to restore harmony. In this case, we're looking at to God, but in general it's done through groups. Let's read Leviticus 6 starting in verse 24 through 30. And again, this is some more about the sin offering, but it talks about this reconciliation. Verse 24, also the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, this is the law of the sin offering in the place where the burnt offering is killed. The sin offering shall be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it shall eat it in a holy place and it shall be eaten in the court of the tabernacle of meeting. Everyone who touches its flesh must be holy, and when the blood is sprinkled on any garment, you shall wash that on which it was sprinkled in a holy place. But the eaten vessel in which it is boiled shall be broken, and if it is boiled in a bronze pot, it shall be both scored and, and rinsed. All males among the priests must eat it, but no sin offering from which any of the blood is brought of the tabernacle meeting is to, be, is to be made an atonement in the holy place and it shall be burned in fire. Now, the NIV says, make an atonement in the holy place but it must not be eaten. In the King James it says reconciliation. Moving on to our next verse here, Ezekiel 45. Ezekiel 45 starting in verse 15 it says, and one lamb out of the flock one out of two hundred of the fat of the pasture for Israel for a meat offering, for a burnt offering, for a peace offering, and to make reconciliation with them, says the Lord. In verse 16 it says, And the people of the land will give this ob obligation for the, pr for the prince in Israel, and shall be the prince's part on the burnt offering and meat offering and drink offerings in the feast and in new moons and the Sabbaths and solemn of the house of Israel it shall prepare the sin offering and the meat offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering and then it says to make reconciliation for the house of Israel in verse 18 this is, the saint, this is the Lord God, the first month, the first day of the month, I shall have a young bull without blemish and cleanse it in the sanctuary. And the priest shall take the blood, verse 19, and a sin offering and put it upon the post of the house and upon the floor comes the set of the altar and, a, and, a, and among the post of the gate of the inner court. And so shall the seventh day of the month for every one that is erred and for him that is simple, he shall be reconciled the house. So shall ye reconcile the house. So again, so this is a day of reconciliation as we heard before, but it's also a day to restore friendships. It's a day to restore harmony. A day of harmony. We'll also cover this reconciliation a little bit more later. Moving on to an, another definition of this word kapar, it's also used as a cleanse. To cleanse to purge or wipe away. We find a direct uh, uh, translation of that in Numbers 35, 33. And it's actually found in the King James Version. And it says in Numbers 35, 33, so, you sh so ye shall not pollute the land, wherein ye are the blood. It defiles the land, and the land cannot be cleansed, kafar of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. In the NIV, it says the blood shed pollutes the land and atonement cannot be made. So again, we are concentrating on the word kapar and all its different, different meanings. And as you move through the Bible, it has different translations. Most of the time it is translated as, 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 a, as atonement, as atonement, and again, in the context of what it's used in, used in, some of these meanings will come through. 
But in this case, we have a day of wiping away of sin, or a day of purging, or a day of cleansing. There's another one of these themes or meanings in the day of atonement. <clears throat> Let's move on to another word. Another Hebrew word. The word is kaporeth. And in this word... It's very different translations between the different translations. So the word proforeth means atonement cover, mercy seat, or the concept of propitiation, which is to gain or regain the favor or goodwill of someone. And in this case for us, it's to gain or regain the favor or goodwill of God. Let's read a little bit about that from the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 20, <coughs> 25. In Exodus 25, 19, <coughs> in the NIV it says, Make one cherub and at one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim as one piece with the cover at the two ends. So this is a cover. Again, this is where Kaporeth has been translated to cover. Exodus 37, 6 in the NIV, it says, He makes an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a half a cubit wide. And then it says in the in New King James and in the King James, that same verse, going to Exodus 25, 19 at first. And it says... Make one cherub at one end. Yeah, I read that out of water a little bit. Sorry about that. Let's go back to Exodus 25, 19. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherub at two ends of it, one piece with the mercy seat. Let's go back to 25, 9, 19 and I'll clear this up. So in the international version, it calls that piece the cover or the anointing cover. And the King James Version, or the New King James Version, calls that same translation the mercy seat. Exodus 37, 6 in the New King James, again, calls it the mercy seat. So which one should it be? Should it be anointing cover, or should it be the mercy seat? Two different translations. Well, actually, they're both right. The anointing cover is probably more accurate, but the mercy seat has some qualities as well. Because another theme of this day, another definition, is the day of mercy. This mercy seat, this anointing cover. Moving on to another word, the word you're probably most familiar with with this day, is the word kippur in Hebrew. Yom Kippur. And it means to be reconciliation of God and humankind through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And again, we find some scriptures in the Old Testament about Kippur. Never translated. There's many of them. There's lots of scriptures about Kafar. There's not a lot about the the the, the Kapareth, and there's also few that are actually the pure word. Kippur, the handout actually has, has those listed for you. But in number 5-8, but if, and it's starting again, we're reading in the New King James first. But if the man has no relative to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution for the wrong must go to the Lord for the priest, in addition to the ram of the anointment, oh, excuse me, the ram of the atonement, which, with which atonement is made for him. So this is the Ram of Atonement, and atonement is where Kapar is translated. And in the NIV, it pretty much says the same thing. It says, the Ram with which atonement is made for the wrongdoer. Instead of repeating itself, it says it once. And that atonement there, or at one mint, is translated from Kapar. In Leviticus 23, 27 through 28, we have another translation of kapar as this atonement or this reconcile. So on the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. That is this day. It shall be a holy convocation. Mr. Hill read that to us. And, you're, and you shall afflict your souls, and you shall offer an offering made of fire to the Lord. You shall do no work on that same day, for this is the day of kapar. 
the day Kippur Pur, the day of atonement, and to make Kippur or atonement for you before the Lord God. The NIV says pretty much the same thing. It says day of atonement or atonement is made for you. And as we saw, the atonement means reconciliation of God and humankind through Jesus Christ's death, through the sacrificial Jesus de death of Jesus Christ. So this then is a day of reconciliation to God by Jesus Christ's blood. It's a day of reconciliation or being reconciled to God. Moving on to the Greek. Let's move on to the Greek. See if I can pronounce these any better. <coughs> So he la come he las come I is another word, and that word is translated as propitiation. It's also translated as atonement. It can mean atonement as well. It means to be propitious, propitious, and make propitiation, which means have mercy or to show favor. So have mercy on or to show favor too. Let's look at this in Luke 18. And the tactor, tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying God be merciful to me a sinner. So this word in the Greek was translated merciful here is also translated perpetuation later in scripture. Now, in NIV says the same thing, but it says, be merciful, be, be, have mercy. In Hebrews 2.17, it says, Therefore all things he has made like his brethren, he might be merciful, a faithful priest, to the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation, to make this high lamakama for the sins of the people. The same word, once used for mercy, now it's used for propitiation. And the NIV actually has the word atonement in the same verse. So Hebrews 2.17 says, the high priest, I'm going to break into the, 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 the verse here, has become merciful, faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement of the sins of the people. So this word is translated merciful, propitiation, and atonement in different translations. So this is a day, another word we see here, another theme for the day. You could say mercy. You could also say to show favor to. This is a day of showing favor to, especially God to us. Another theme. We have another Greek word. This will be our fifth word. The fifth word that is sometimes translated atonement is Helatazrion. Helatazrion. It's up here. And we find that in Romans 3.23. And three, actually it's in 3.25. But I'm going to read Romans 3.23 through 26. And it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through His redemption that in that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be justified as the justifier of the of one who has faith in, in Jesus. In the NIV it actually says the word atonement. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. <clears throat> now, propitiation or sin offering, covering of the ark which was sprinkled among the blood. So this is actually pointing back, Romans 3.25 is pointing back to the ark, the atonement cover, and the mercy seat. In Hebrews 9.5 we have this mercy seat or this atonement cover mentioned again, and I find it interesting. I'll just brief, briefly read it to you. It says, and above it all were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, which it says in the New King James, of these things which we cannot speak of now. And then the NIV it says, above the ark were the cherubim, the glory overshadowing the atonement cover, 
But then it clearly says we cannot discuss these things in detail now. And my question is, I want to know the detail now, right? Why, why is it not telling me the detail? But anyways, these are, these are how these things are translated. This same word is translated as propitiation, um, uh, atonement, I can't see it, yeah, and, and uh, mercy seat and atonement cover, which means this is a day of atoning blood. This is the, the way we were able to have this propitiation was through, it says, which was the sprinkled with the atoning blood. And that's the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. The last word, our last word is Kalalea or Kalalagha. We find that in Romans 11, 9, uh, 11, 15 and 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. Romans 11, I'll read you the full thought, 13 through 15. It says, For I speak to you Gentiles, insomuch as I am an apostle of, of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke jealousy to those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is recorded of the word that will be their acceptance, but from life of the dead. And Romans 11.15 says, and that's where it answer, for if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, again this word, what will their acceptance but from life from the dead? And again, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19, actually uses this term, again, I'm not going to read that to you, but you can look that up, but it actually talks about this reconciliation and restoration to the favor of God. So this is also a day of restoration. Let's go through this one more time. This is a day of covering. This is a day of the sin sacrifice fulfilled. This is a day of peace and harmony. This is a day of wipe away sin. This is a day of mercy, that mercy seat. This is a day to be reconciled to God. This is a day that God shows favor to us. And this is a day of atoning blood and a day of restoration. This is truly a day of atonement, a day of atonement. After our Lord and Savior, His Majesty Jesus Christ returns, there will be the first day of atonement when the whole world will fast. The whole world will have an atonement with God on this day. Well, we have one picture. We didn't have a lot of pictures because this PowerPoint was fasting when it comes to pictures. So here's one picture. <laughs> you see the mercy seat, you see the atonement cover. Once a year, a human being in the, at the old time went in there and sprinkled the blood. But once a year, the God being that we believe became Jesus Christ at the time of the Israelites in the Old Covenant, though he had not yet died as a sin sacrifice, but he was the mediator before Moses. He, it has always been through Christ that we are able to be at one with God. It is our Lord and Savior, His Majesty Jesus Christ, that we can have this salvation and we can be first fruits. This was the plan of God from the beginning. It is Jesus Christ as the sin sacrifice with his anointing blood that covers our sin, that gives us everlasting peace and harmony, wipes away that sin with mercy, reconciles us to God so God can show his favor and then we are restored. Let me say that one more time. It is Jesus Christ as the sin sacrifice with his anointing, excuse me, with his atoning blood that covers our sin, gives us everlasting peace and harmony, wipes away sin with mercy, reconciles us to God so God can show us favor and then we are restored. With knowing that, why would you want to eat and drink at all? Have a meaningful day of atonement.